miss to Children's Church, turn with me, please, to Matthew chapter 26. Matthew 26, we're going to read at the end of this chapter and into the beginning of chapter 27. We are continuing to discuss our morning messages on Wednesday night. We have had some really good discussions lately, so appreciate those of you who have been a part of those come out and join us and We have been publishing questions sometimes on Sunday morning, but we've also started to get some good feedback from the congregation on other questions to discuss. So trying to factor those in and and get those in, we'll probably just be emailing them out late Tuesday, early Wednesday. So uh, if you're not getting those and you want to receive those questions, let me know. We'll make sure to include you uh, in the email distribution for those. One other thing, after the service today, I've got to leave and go over to the Powell congregation and assist with Bruce Chelta serving the Lord's table. Their service is at 11. So when we're done here, I'll I'll shake hands for a few moments and then scoot on over there and help with finishing up their Lord's table time. For today, let's look at Matthew chapter 26. We'll start at verse 69 and we'll read into chapter 27. And stop at verse 10. Let us hear the word of the Lord. Now Peter was sitting out in the courtyard, and a servant girl came to him. You also were with Jesus of Galilee, she said. But he denied it before them all. I don't know what you're talking about, he said. Then he went out to the gateway where another servant girl saw him and said to the people there, This fellow was with Jesus of Nazareth. He denied it again with an oath. I don't know the man. After a little while, those standing there went up to Peter and said, Surely you are one of them. Your accent gives you away. Then he began to call down curses, and he swore to them, I don't know the man. Immediately a rooster crowed. Then Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken. Before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. Early in the morning, all the chief priests and the elders of the people made their plans how to have Jesus executed. So they bound him, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate, the governor. When Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he was seized with remorse. And returned the thirty pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders. I have sinned, he said, for I have betrayed innocent blood. What is that to us, they replied. That's your responsibility. So Judas threw the money into the temple and left. And then he went away and hanged himself. The chief priest picked up the coins and said, It is against the law to put this money into the treasury since it is blood money. So they decided to use the money to buy the potter's field as a burial place for foreigners. That is why it has been called the field of blood to this day. Then what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. They took the 30 pieces of silver, the price set on him by the people of Israel, and they used them to buy the potter's field as the Lord commanded me. Amen. This is God's word. Let us pray. Father in heaven, again, we ask for the entrance of your word to bring light. Forgive us of where we hold opinions that are contrary to your word. Forgive us of where we fashioned you into our image. And help us in the scriptures to see the glory of God in the face of Christ. It may be a terrifying image, but it is a gracious image. And when we come in repentance and faith to this Savior, we see the beauty of holiness. And we have life and light, and freedom. And so as we open the word, and as we consider it now, give us that grace to receive you as you are set forth in the scriptures. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. A passage that we have just read this morning told two stories, Peter's denial and Judas's betrayal. And you notice as we read, they came back to back. Now, the events that are connected with Judas's remorse and his suicide and his returning the money, these most likely happened after the official condemnation of Jesus, possibly even after his execution, whereas Peter's denial is before the Lord is led away to be crucified. But if you've noticed the way Matthew has arranged the stories, he's put them side by side. 
And he's done that on purpose. He wants them to accompany one another in the telling of the gospel story. In fact, throughout this chapter, Matthew 26, uh, Jesus himself predicts Judas' betrayal, the disciples' desertion, and Peter's denial, all three. And then as you finish the chapter, they are all fulfilled in the very same order in which our Lord announced them. Now, when we read these two stories, and these are the ones that we will focus on, you may have noticed they seem to have a lot in common, don't they? Jesus predicts that both Peter will deny and that Judas will betray. Both of them in time do so. They break their loyalty in one way or the other to Christ. After their actions, they both express regret. And in fact, Judas's regret is accompanied by a confession of guilt. I have sinned. Acceptance that he's responsible for the death of the innocent and his restitution of the money, attempting to make right what he has done. They seem to have a lot of similarity. And yet, at the same time, Peter and Judas come to radically different ends, do they not? Peter is eventually restored to his Lord. He goes on to lead the church. He is the central figure in the opening chapters of the book of Acts, the first 12 chapters. Whereas Judas, on the other hand, he hangs himself. He's called the son of destruction. And according to Acts 125, he went to his own place, a vague but very ominous sounding final destination. Why do they have such different ends? when they appear to have quite similar actions. In order to answer that question, I want us to look at Peter's denial and Judas's betrayal. And then after we've done that, after we've put them side by side, we can make a few conclusions before we close. So first, let's look at Peter's denial. Let's analyze it in some detail. We read it there at the end of chapter 26, but let's just look at some of the buildup that leads to those actions. Earlier in the chapter, in verses 31 through 35, Jesus anticipates this denial. He predicts that before the night is over, all of the disciples will abandon him. Jesus knows what is coming. It's according to the scriptures. He will be betrayed. He will be arrested. That will be shocking to the disciples. And so he wants to warn them. He wants to prepare them in advance. Guess how you are going to react when I am arrested. He says in verse 31, this very night, all of you will fall away on account. Of me. And that word fall away, we use that, and the scriptures use that sometimes to refer to people who who leave the faith, apostasy, falling away from the faith, and coming into eternal destruction. That's the way the word is sometimes used. But it's not always used that intensely. It means to cause, to stumble, to take offense, and it is sometimes used just to refer to temporary setbacks. And this is what Jesus has in mind here. This very night, you'll all run away. You'll all desert me temporarily. Notice that in verse 32, he says, after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. So already the Lord anticipates a gracious restoration. But in order for that to happen, they will first desert him. And it's at that point that Peter speaks up, and he denies that he will run away like the other disciples. He says in verse 31, even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. All of the others may leave you, but Peter will maintain his loyalty. And if we've seen something in the Gospels from Peter, he often acts as a spokesman for the group. He's often quick to express what the group is feeling, but here it's the opposite. It's distancing himself from the group. Lord, they may not have the commitment and the bravery, but I will go with you even if I must go with you to death. And Peter resp- or Jesus responds uh, with a warning. Truly, I tell you, Peter, this very night before the rooster crows, you will deny me, disown me three times. You'll disassociate yourself from me three times before the night is over. Now, When Peter confesses his loyalty, 
Again, even to the point of death, even if all leave you, verse 35, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. Maybe we should view that as a good development. I mean, after all, Peter earlier in chapter 16, he denied the idea that Jesus would die. He said, let that, let that be far from you, Lord, that you will, de- that you will die. So here's Peter beginning to recognize that Jesus is going to die. And Peter is willing to go with him. Is this a good thing? No, I, I think we should view Peter here as, as still struggling to accept what his Lord is telling him and to come to grips with Jesus' announcements. Sometimes Jesus will say things and he, do, he wants to test people. He wants to hear from them a confession of faith. Think back to chapter 16. Who do people say that I, the Son of Man, am? He wants Peter to answer, you are the Messiah the son of the living God, but not here. When Jesus is warning Peter that you're going to fall away, you're going to desert me tonight, that is not the time for Peter to say, no, I'm loyal. That is the time for Peter to say, look, Jesus, how might I avoid such an action? How, how might I find grace and help not to fall away during this time? If we were to look at Luke's gospel, Jesus is even stronger. He says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift all of you as wheat. He he identifies Satan as the, the ultimate agent behind this temptation. And he's saying he wants to sift you, all of you, like wheat. That is the time for humility. That is the time to ask Christ for help. But Peter does not. He says this will never happen, Lord. Now, lest we be too hard on Peter, or let me put it like this, let's not single Peter out. At the end of verse 35, notice all of the other disciples join Peter in saying that they will never deny or leave the Lord. And I highlight that to say, what we're reading here is not just Peter's trial. This is something any of us might do. This is a temptation that all of us will probably face at one point. And if we are not careful, we could, we could cave under the pressure of the moment and not maintain our loyalty to Christ. We need grace from God to maintain our faith and our witness. We, we need grace to hear Jesus saying that should that happen, there will be restoration. So let us see ourselves in Peter's shoes. Let's see ourselves in the disciples' shoes as we go through this story. Now, As we move on from there, at first things look kind of good. It looks like Peter will truly follow the Lord, even if it means personal risk. So the Roman soldiers come, they arrest Jesus, and when they come to do that, Peter draws a sword. He strikes the high priest's servant, he cuts off his ear. Jesus puts a stop to it, he heals the servant, he he submits to his arrest, and at that point, all of the disciples do indeed run away. But we do read... That Peter continues to follow at a distance. He comes right up to the courtyard. He sits down with the guards so that he can see the outcome of Jesus' trial. So yes, he's a little tentative. He's he's a distance from his orbit. Hey, he is still following him. Closer perhaps than the other disciples. But there are warning signs. We should, be, we should be weary that something is going to go very wrong. Not only has, has Jesus predicted the denial, and not only has Peter shown overconfidence in the face of that, we, we also see the disciples not being spiritually aware. Where do we see this? In the Garden of Gethsemane. You know this story well. Jesus goes to the garden to pray. And he tells Peter and James and John, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here, watch with me, pray with me for one hour. Jesus goes away and what happens when he comes back? They're asleep. Three times they fall asleep in the Garden of Eden and Jesus, or in the Gethsemane. And Jesus has to tell them, watch and pray so that you will not enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. You say you want to go with me to the end. But if there is not that spiritual awareness, if you don't watch and pray, then you can't. Jesus is warning them, in and of yourselves, you don't have the resources to go all the way with me. And so finally, Jesus' predictions are realized. And that's the opening verses that we read there at the end of chapter 26. Peter is sitting in a high priest's courtyard. And one of the servants says, You also 
You were with Jesus of Galilee. Now, how does this servant girl know that? According to John's gospel, she was part of the arresting party. She went with this group and she saw Peter with Jesus in the garden. Well, well, Peter pretends to be ignorant. I, I don't know what you're talking about. But if you are being accused of being with Jesus and you're trying to act like you're ignorant, that is a denial. So there's number one. Peter leaves the courtyard. Get away from the attention. But he's spotted by another servant girl. And, and she says now this time to the crowd, hey, this fellow was with Jesus of Nazareth. Well, Peter's starting to feel the heat. So again, he denies it. And this time he swears an oath. He makes a solemn promise. I do not know the man. We talked about oaths in the Sermon on the Mount, did we not? It's, it's your way of, of calling God as your witness to affirm the truthfulness of what you're saying. And and Jesus warns us, does he not, not to swear oaths falsely. Beware of those oaths that mask deceit. This is exactly what Peter is doing here when confronted with this crowd. The intensity is increasing. Until finally, this crowd comes up to Peter and they say, yes, surely you are one of them. Your accent gives you away. uh, Peter was from Galilee. Remember, the whole first part of Matthew takes place in Galilee, this northern ministry. And in the north, they spoke a different dialect of Aramaic. And people in the south of Israel would make fun of the way that northerners talk. There was a little bit of regional bias. We can understand that, can we not, in our own country. So there's bias against these folks coming down. Remember that when Jesus entered on the day of the triumphal entry, how was he introduced? This is Jesus, the prophet of Galilee in the north. So so they know he's an outsider, and they're pretty sure that he's one of Jesus' followers. And so Peter now says, he gives the strongest denunciation. Verse 74, he began to call down curses, and he swore to them. Again, another oath, I don't know the man. He denies it. He swears an oath that he's telling the truth, and he calls down curses. Now, Matthew doesn't tell us who he curses, but everywhere else that this word, this verb is used, there's always a named object. This is the only place where we're not told who it is that's being cursed. It is very likely, if not possible, that Peter is calling down a curse on Jesus himself and saying that he does not know him. And immediately the rooster crows and Peter remembers Jesus' words. The pressure has become too much. A servant girl and then a servant girl to a crowd and then the crowd itself. And, And Peter has tried to retreat from the courtyard to outside the gate to just outside. And as he retreats, he he escalates his denials. Ignorance to an oath to a curse. So that when he finally hears the rooster crow, he weeps bitterly. Now that's Peter's denial. Now let's look at Judas's betrayal, and then we'll draw some conclusions. There's two questions I want to think about while we look at Judas's betrayal. First, why did Judas do this? Why did Judas betray the Lord he had traveled with for three and a half years, and allegedly been very loyal, at least from the outside. Remember, when Jesus announced his betrayal, nobody knew it was Judas. They didn't think he was an obvious candidate. Why did he betray Jesus? And then secondly, what did he feel after it was all over? Well, at the beginning of this chapter, Matthew notes that the chief priests and the elders, they they want to seize Jesus, but they're afraid there will be a riot if they do it during the festival. The very next story, Jesus is in the home of Simon the leper, and he is anointed with expensive perfume by an unnamed woman. All of the disciples object to this. And if we read John's gospel, again, Judas is the main objector. They say, what? You should have sold this money and given it to the poor. But what is Judas' real motive? He wants to take some of that money because he is the keeper of the money bag. Very next story after that one. Judas agrees to betray Jesus. What will you give me if I hand him over to you? They make an agreement, and he is given the 30 pieces of silver. And the nature of the agreement is he'll go out, and he'll come back, and they'll report to them Jesus' movement so they can come and intercept him at a private time when there is no crowd. How much money is this? Somewhere between one and four months' wages. So a decent amount, but nothing that's going to set Judas up 
for life. I think what we have to see here, especially with it, with it coming right out of the story of the oil, is Judas saying, I'm going to get my money one way or the other. He was a thief. He was materialistic. And Jesus' actions had interfered with his ability to get more money. And so he says, okay, I'll remove that obstacle. I'll make a little bit of money in the process. He was materialistic. I think also, though, let's look for a little bit of a larger motive, maybe one that's been brewing in Judas' mind for some time here. He loved money, yes, but I also wonder if he was becoming disillusioned with Jesus as a whole, when Jesus was anointed at Bethany, what did he say? Why was this for? To prepare him for burial. So not only is Judas losing an opportunity to steal money, but here they are in Jerusalem. Triumphant entry is passed. And what is Jesus saying? I'm going to die. And I wonder if at that point, Judas finally and definitively realized this is not a national liberator. This is not a man who's going to come here and overthrow the Romans and set up our kingdom. I'm not going to get anything out of following this guy. No money, no power. In fact, my own life might be at danger. And you know what? It's probably best if this guy was gotten out of the way before he fails and before he is defeated. And again, this is actually something that all of the disciples at one point Struggled with. Peter himself denied that Jesus would die in Jerusalem. But what did we see about Peter? He is starting to come to grips with this truth. The other disciples are starting to come to grips with the fact that Jesus will die, that he will bring about salvation in a different way from what anyone else expected. Judas, however, did not. He rejected that idea. You know who Judas is thinking like? Saul of Tarshish. Before Saul became a Christian, he's looking at Jesus as a threat to Israel. Someone who is in the way of Israel's religious tradition. Someone who needs to be gotten out of the way. And so I wonder if his main motive is simply this, unbelief. He does not view Jesus as the Son of God. The one who has come to save his people from their sins. He's got a material outlook. A human outlook, Jesus is just a way to get more money and power versus the Savior that Judas needs. That's why he betrays him. So then secondly, what does he feel after the betrayal? Well, according to chapter 27, again, the verses we read, when Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he was seized with remorse and returned the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders. I have sinned, he said, for I have betrayed innocent blood. And the question is this, is this repentance? Is this him being sorry for what he has done and repenting of his actions? What can we say about Judas's spiritual state based on these actions? A couple things. First, seized with remorse there. In verse 3, it translates a verb which means to to have regrets about something. To wish that you could undo something. So he is sorrowful. He is remorseful. He regrets what he has done. But this is not the verb that the New Testament uses for repentance. That is a very different word. And I I would suggest this. There is a difference between sorrow and repentance. There is a difference between feeling bad about one's actions, wishing you could undo them, and repenting before God. What is the difference? Well, on one level, if you think about it, sorrow and regret, ultimately you focus inward upon yourself. I hate what I've done. I hate myself. I wish I would die. But but it all terminates there. Whereas repentance is what? I have done wrong before God. And I am ashamed in His presence, but... If I come to him and if I turn away from this action, there will be forgiveness and cleansing and mercy. One feeling focuses on inward and drives one inward to despair and madness, whereas the other one drives one outward to God and to his law and to life. And and we see that playing out when Judas tries to return the money. Again, he's trying to undo the consequences of his actions. Hey, hey, take the money back. I, I did wrong. But you know what else he's probably doing here? I think he's trying to abdicate his responsibility. 
You take the money back. It's your fault that this happened. You're the ultimate wrongdoers in this situation. Is it not like Pilate? Washing his hands. I am innocent of this man's blood. And you see the chief priests refuse it. They don't give him that out. And so overwhelmed with his grief and overwhelmed with his guilt, he goes out and he takes his life. I think we can conclude that Judas is not coming to God in an attitude of repentance. He's not coming in faith. He's not coming seeking mercy. He is just overwhelmed and crushed by guilt and despair. And it leads him to take his life. And I don't think, I'll say this, I don't think that every person who takes their life is therefore unsaved. But I think in Judas's case, we have enough information to conclude that, that this is the outcome of him seeing no hope and not seeking any hope from God alone. What conclusion then can we make? What is the difference between Peter and Judas? I think 2 Corinthians 7.10 Best sums it up. I'll read it to you. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow brings death. You hear Paul there distinguishing between two types of sorrow, godly sorrow and worldly sorrow. Godly sorrow produces a change of heart. Repentance, it leads to salvation. It terminates ultimately where? With God. Worldly sorrow, on the other hand, terminates with self. And it doesn't lead to repentance. And it's not just surface sorrow. Oh, you don't real, you're not really sorrow. No, it can be to your core. To the point, that, like Judas, you would go out and take your life. But if it just terminates with you, and there's never that seeking of God for help, then it is worldly sorrow that leads to bitterness and despair. Really, it's, it's just not enough to be sorry for one's sins. Don't stop there. Repent of your sins. Seek God for his forgiveness. And this is good news. This is not hammering you saying you're not doing enough. You need to, you not, don't just feel bad. No, this is good news. Friend, the worst thing you can do when you sin against God and someone else, the worst thing you can do is turn inward on yourself and try to remedy your actions yourself. That is a downward spiral that leads to despair. God himself is telling you, when you sin, repent and trust Christ for forgiveness. Come to the cross. Look away from what you have done. You can fall and rise again. Why? Because Jesus died and rose again. And he says in Matthew 12, anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. You can be forgiven for denying Christ when you repent and when you trust in him. And I think from the human perspective, the ultimate difference is that Peter repented. Peter sought God for help. Judas turned inward on himself and went, as we've read, to his own place. He, he felt regret. And who in this room has never felt regret over something you did? But it can't stop there. It has to ultimately go to God and repentance and trust. Lastly, though, before we finish, let us also simply highlight God's sovereignty in the difference between Judas and Peter. This is why there can be mercy for those who fail. Concerning Judas, Luke 2.21 Jesus says, the hand of him who is going to betray me is with mine on the table. The Son of Man will go as it has been decreed. John 17, Jesus says, while I was with them, the disciples, I protected them and kept them safe by that name you gave me. None has been lost except the one doomed to destruction so that scripture would be fulfilled. As our own confession states, for the manifestation of God's glory, some men and angels are predestinated unto everlasting life, whereas others are foreordained to everlasting death. Now, that is a hard saying, but is it an accurate, it is an accurate summary 
of what Scripture teaches. What do the Scriptures say about Peter? Jesus told him, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift all of you, everyone in this room, like wheat, but I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith will not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. Why did Peter come back? Because Jesus interceded for him. That though he would deny, his faith would not fail. And when he failed, that he would return in repentance and go on to strengthen his brothers. You know why we can be forgiven when we fail? Because Jesus chose us in him before the foundation of the world and gave himself for us and right now is interceding before God's presence for us. And that should highlight and should make us thank God for his mercy every time we sin. Let us pray and give thanks. Father in heaven, we thank you for the mercies of God in Christ. And we thank you for saving our souls. And we thank you for upholding us with the word of your power. And as you do that for the whole creation, so you uphold the faith of your people by your intercession before God's throne. Father, I pray this morning for us as a congregation that we would celebrate and rejoice in that grace. I pray for those among us who have not sought you for that grace, that they would do so. That they would turn in faith to Christ and lay hold of the water of life that is given freely to those who are thirsty and who would take it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing hymn 203, And Can It Be? We'll sing verses 1 and 4 here at the end. Hymn 203, stand with me, verses 1 and 4.